like these girls this morning? Do you remember when you were baptized? You know, uh, something interesting about when I was baptized, I remember, I, mean, I know I was baptized. I have the certificate to prove it somewhere, right? Um, and I remember the guy that baptized me was our pastor, old Tooney Ropp, out there in Lamont, Oklahoma, at the little Baptist church there, Pastor Tooney. Um, in fact, I saw him maybe five years ago at the men's retreat. We were down at Falls Creek, guys, some of you were with me. And he comes walking up, he's got on his bib overalls, and his hair is all pastorly, slicked up and looking good, like he always did. And he said, well, Brother Andy, how are you doing? And this guy, you know, he baptized me like 40 years ago. It's a long time, well, no longer than that. Oh, my goodness, uh, 45 years ago. Uh, and we had that little, uh, you know, reunion there at Falls Creek. That was pretty cool. I don't remember getting in the water. Um, I don't remember anything that was said. I don't remember... I'm pretty sure we didn't have baptism robes. We were kind of out on the fringe. You know, we're in rural Oklahoma. We probably just had on, uh, you know, shorts and a T-shirt or something like that. It wasn't fancy like we have these fancy baptism robes and stuff like that. Um, I don't remember anything about it. But you know what I do remember? I remember when I got saved at church camp. I was eight or nine. I was probably about nine years old. And when I came home... You know, they told me that I needed to get baptized. I needed to follow up with baptism, and I needed to talk to my mom and dad about that. And I was just scared to death to tell my parents. I don't have any idea why. They, they took us to church all the time when we were growing up. You know, they were believers. Uh, but I was just so scared to tell them I'd gotten saved at camp and I was going to get baptized. But then the whole experience of being baptized, I don't even remember for some reason, whatever. Um, I think that baptism, like for me as a little kid and for a lot of people, I think baptism is a confusing aspect of the Christian faith, but it's also a very important part of our Christian faith. I think it's kind of confusing because we say it's not necessary to be baptized to be saved. Baptism is not a requirement for salvation, but it is a requirement for obedience if you want to be obedient to Christ, well, the, one of the first steps that you take in obedience as a new believer is to follow through with baptism. We take that from the Great Commission. When Jesus said to go into all nations and make disciples, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded. So we, we are reaching the people around the world, reaching people with the gospel. We're teaching them to observe Christ. And then he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So as a part of this commission, we call it the great commission that Jesus gives us, we see that it's a real early step in a believer's life in obedience to follow Christ in baptism. In fact, what we're going to see today in Matthew 3 is that Jesus modeled this for us. He did this in obedience to the Father to fulfill all righteousness. And so, you know, this, this idea of baptism, maybe for you it's one of those things where, you know, you've thought about it, you know you're saved, but you've never followed through with baptism. Okay, if, if you're 11, it's a little nerve-wracking, right, girls? It's a little bit much to get up there and to read your testimony or have somebody read your testimony and, and get baptized up there. If you're uh, 20 and above, the nerve level just ratchets up every year. If you're 60 and you've never been baptized, then you're sitting here, you know, gripping the sides of the chair, the front of the chair, the person's hand next to you, and you're thinking, there is no way I'm going to do that. Well, I will tell you, probably the oldest person I've ever baptized is, was in their 80s, and um, they came through with flying colors, right? I mean, I've, in fact, I can tell you, in all honesty, I've lost no one in the baptistry waters. Um, I have, amen, right. Well, I have been paid off a, to hold them under a little longer, but I never keep them under... You know, until that point, you know, where the bubbles stop, right? I always bring them up before the bubbles stop. Um, so I want to read to you Matthew chapter 3. And I want you to think about, if, if you're saved, you know you're born again. You know that you're a believer. You have Jesus in your heart. You know you're going to heaven. And you can remember your baptism. Man, just relish that. Enjoy that. And you don't obviously don't have to remember specific dates, times, the event itself. You don't have to remember the specifics on it. I, I don't. I don't remember that. But you, you know that you know that you know. That's like me. Relish that. It's a wonderful thing. Um, if you've never followed with the Lord with baptism, maybe as you're a student, you're a child, you're, you're younger. Um, I've had several kids this week at Vacation Bible School ask me about baptism. And so um, maybe just allow God to speak to your heart through his word today. 
uh, through Christ's example for us. And I want to encourage you to, to step out in faith and say, I'm willing to do that. I want to follow the Lord in baptism. Uh, Matthew chapter 3 says, uh, says this, And Jesus came from Galilee into the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. Now John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. But Jesus answered him and said, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened and uh, to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest upon him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You know, um, John's baptism, this is, this is what is, this is, again, something that's a little confusing, honestly. Um, John's baptism, if you remember to last week's sermon, John's baptism was a call to repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Remember the Pharisees and the scribes, the Sadducees, they were going out to be baptized by John, and he warned them. You know, he said, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Um, if you want to repent, bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance, right? Show me uh, your repentance. Don't just talk about it, but let me see it. And so John's baptism was this bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It was a calling of God's people, the Israelites, back to God. It was a baptism of repentance and the forgiveness of sin. These people, it says they were coming to John to be baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins and turning away from their sin and being baptized uh, by him. Now, here's the problem for us. If you're thinking ahead of this a little bit, you're thinking, wait a minute, why did Jesus get baptized then? Because he was sinless. And so if John's baptism is about the forgiveness of sins and repentance, I mean, what was Jesus repenting of? And the answer is, is nothing. He wasn't, doing, uh, he wasn't being baptized so his sins would be forgiven. He had no sins to be forgiven of. He wasn't being baptized for the repentance of, you know, repenting of his sins, confessing his sins. He had nothing to confess. So I want to give you a couple of reasons here from uh, Matthew chapter 3 and some cross-references here in, in the gospel and the New Testament and in the Old Testament. I want to give you some cross-references that will help us maybe understand why Jesus was being baptized. First, uh, the word is obligation. And what I mean by that is he wasn't obliged to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. He was sinless. When we talk about this idea of obligation, he says it himself. Jesus says, let us do this now. Uh, to fulfill all righteousness, all right? And so what he was doing is he was obeying the Father to the fullest degree. Whatever the Lord, whatever God expected, God the Father expected of Jesus, he did it. It was an act of obedience for Jesus, obedience to the Father. In fact, that word fulfill there is a very important word. The word fulfill in verse 15 is a key word in not just in this little section here where Jesus is baptized, but in all of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Remember all of those events that happened at Jesus' birth? It says that, um, you know, the angel warned Joseph to take Mary as his wife, even though she was found out to be pregnant before they'd come together. What was, that? What was the reason behind that? Why should he do that? It says, because this was to fulfill what the prophet had spoken. When they fled to Egypt, when Herod was going to kill all those babies out there. Why did they do that? It says, this happened so to, to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, what was written by the prophet. All of these things that happened when they came back from Egypt and went to Nazareth. Why? To fulfill what had been spoken or written by the prophet. All these fulfillment, 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 fulfillment. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the things of God from the Old Testament, prophesying, looking forward to the coming of Messiah. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. And in Jesus' day, in John the Baptist's day, um, the, the, the ceremonial washings by Jews had become a, a, had become a thing, right? And so they were going out to John to be baptized by him. And it, was, it wasn't for um, the remission of sin. It was for the forgiveness of sin. It was a repentant act. And so they were confessing their sin, admitting that they needed God in their lives and that they needed to turn back to God. Well, where does this come from? Well, it comes from Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. 
Um, in Malachi chapter 4, if you go back and read that, the whole little um, prophetic book of Malachi, it's really interesting because Israel had turned away from God in many ways. And um, God said he's going to send the Messiah. He's going to send his Christ. And it was going to be a great and terrible day of judgment that was going to come upon all people. But he said, but before I do that, this is what he says in verse 5. He said, I will send you my uh, servant Elijah, the prophet, before that great and awesome, terrible day of the Lord. That's that day of judgment. And he, Elijah, will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. Literally, he says, I will strike the land with a curse, is what uh, Malachi says. That's the end of your Old Testament. So before that great and awesome day of judgment comes, before Messiah comes, he's going to send his prophet Elijah, whom we know from last week, again, Jesus said, if you care to believe it. This is Jesus' words, not mine. Jesus says, if you care to believe it, John is the Elijah who was to come. He was the voice crying in the wilderness, and his message was what? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You see, John's message of baptism is very similar for us, because baptism doesn't save us. It's the same thing. We are admitting that we're sinners. We're uh, you know, confessing that sin to God and we're standing before everyone saying, I needed Jesus to save me from my sin by his blood and now I'm being baptized into Christ, like I quoted earlier, baptized into Christ, dying to myself, and now I'm raised up to walk in a new life. You see, that's what John's message was for the Israelites, for the Jews of Jesus' day. Repent and come back to God, turn to God. He was going to turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the children to their fathers. He's going to you know, restore relationships. There was going to be reconciliation and ultimately reconciliation with God. That's the ultimate reconciliation. That's the ultimate restoration is restoration with our relationship with God, which only comes through Christ. I kind of um, think of John's message of repent and turn back to God as kind of like that, that midnight cry. The la this is your last moment. This is your opportunity. Now is the time to turn back to God to seek forgiveness. And the way that that was symbolized, the way they saw that, the way it was practiced was he was baptizing them. So John's message, this is very important. John's message and, and John's role as this last prophet was uh, God-ordained. Right? This is a divine plan. This is a divine part of God's plan for the redemption, redemption of humanity. And that that is why repentance and the confession of our sin to, to God and seeking forgiveness and repentance is still an integral part of our faith. Now that is a requirement for salvation. You have to turn from your sin and turn to God. It's symbolized in baptism. So John's message, his baptism... His role as the prophet, the, the message of repent for the kingdom of God at hand, is a God-ordained prophetic role and message. Jesus submitting to that baptism, right, is an example for us. He's modeling for us what it means to be humble and obedient to God the Father uh, that we can follow in his footsteps. So he confirmed everything that John was doing here. He was confirming John's baptism, that it was a valid and important baptism. He was confirming John's role as that prophet. Like I, I love to say this. He's got one foot in the Old Testament, one foot in the New Testament, John the Baptist. It affirmed the message that he preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now remember this, in this first one here, under obligation, this that word fulfill. Jesus was being obedient to the Father. That word fulfill means to be completely uh, obedient in everything, in every part of a relationship with God. It's being obedient to God in every aspect of that relationship with God. And when it says that Jesus was fulfilling all righteousness in doing this, he wasn't becoming righteous. He was the righteous one. Right? In fact, Paul says that he who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. He imparts his righteousness to us and he took our sin upon himself when he died on the cross for us. And so Jesus is fulfilling this act of obedience before God following you know, John in baptism here. So this event, this baptism, concludes 
one phase of Jesus' life and well, not really his ministry yet, but his life. So he's, we have his birth and the, the nativity stories, you know, and the, the birth narrative. And then he kind of about 30 years of obscurity, right? We don't really hear about Jesus. He has one time where he's 12 years old and he goes to the temple with his you know, mother and, and Joseph or Mary and Joseph. But other than that, we know nothing. And so here's this inauguration into the ministry and the message and ultimately the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. So this is a big part of this um, fulfilling all righteousness. It takes Jesus into that next part of his life and ministry. The next thing I want you to see is this, and it's consecration. In consecration. In the Old Testament, this is kind of an interesting connection here. If you read in Deuteronomy chapter 29, you'll read about how the priests were made worthy of going into the temple or the tabernacle, whichever time it was. After the temple was built, it was the temple. They had to be worthy to go into the temple. And what they would have to do is they would have to go through ceremonial washings. And if they didn't do it just right according to the religious law, the meticulous religious law, then they were not clean. They were unclean. And they were in danger of dying going into the presence of God. And so they had to go through these ceremonial washings. And then they would be anointed with oil, and then they would offer sacrifices for themselves. So before they could go uh, before God on behalf of the people, they would have to go before God on their own behalf. And so they would offer sacrifices for themselves, and then they would go in and offer sacrifices to God for the forgiveness of sins. This is in tabernacle worship in the Old Testament. And so they would uh, set these priests aside. They would consecrate them for a very specific important task these offerings of sacrifices and so they would consecrate them they would wash them they would go through these ceremonial washings and these anointings and this is one of the things that you see in Jesus at his baptism that he's washed right and that we know it's not washing away any sin because he's sinless but it's this this symbolism this picture of being cleansed being washed like that ceremonial washing and then the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus in the form of a dove, which is, we always have always seen that in Scripture, as the, the, the Holy Spirit is this dove. And so you have the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus, so he is anointed for this ministry, consecrated, set apart for this special ministry. And what is that? It's ultimately to the cross where you and I would find salvation in him and only in him. Um, you say, well, what about, so there's the ceremonial washings, there's the anointing, the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove. Well, what about the sacrifice that the priests were, at, at, were required to offer? Listen to this. Why didn't Jesus offer a sacrifice? Well, here you go. This is Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. Hebrews 7, 26. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, Jesus, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens, the innocent Lamb of God, this is who Jesus is, our priest, who is holy, innocent, unstained, separated, and uh, which is a word for consecrated, set aside, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like the priest before him, to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins and then for those sins of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself up. So why is Jesus not after offering these sacrifices like the priest did? Because he is the sacrifice. He did it one time. See, they did it every day, the daily sacrifice, morning and evening sacrifice. They had special sacrifices for guilt offerings, sin offerings. You knew you sinned and you needed to go seek forgiveness and you'd have to go burn an offering, take an offering to the Lord. That was a sin offering. A guilt offering was in case you thought you might have sinned but weren't quite sure. And so you just go offer one just in case, right? I mean, there was all, seriously, there was, all, there was multiple, multiple different uh, forms and fashions for these uh, sacrifices in the Old Testament, but not with Jesus. Once and for all, period. And that's it. And so he is set aside, consecrated as our high, high, our high priest who intercedes for us before the Father, who is our intercessor, who is our uh, mediator, who gave himself as a sacrifice that we could have that uh, relationship with God the Father. So you have obligation and consecration. The next one I want you to see is uh, validation. Validation. In submitting to John's baptism, Jesus 
is approving of John's ministry and in doing so, obligating those people of that day, all of the you know, believers of that day, and us today to heed and obey John's message. Right? This is validating John's message as Jesus is being baptized by John. What do I mean by that? Validating John's message. Um, that me- what was the message? You, you can never forget this. It's such an important part of the gospel of Matthew. The important part of the gospel. It is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what John said when Jesus, in just another chapter, when Jesus goes out to preach the gospel, it says he went from town to village preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is near you or is upon you. When Paul went around preaching, going from Damascus and all around to Asia Minor and to Rome and back to Jerusalem, he said, everywhere I went, I preached what? Repent and turn to God. This is Acts 26, 20. Repent and turn to God, doing the deeds worthy of repentance. Right? So this is the message of your New Testament. It's the message of the gospel. It's the message of the Old Testament. That's what all the prophets were saying. Repent and turn back to God. Repent and turn back to God. And John the Baptist said the same thing. Jesus validates that message. Listen to this. This is great. This is Matthew 21. In Matthew 21, um, Jesus has done a couple things here to upset the status quo. Um, in Matthew 21, it says, and when he entered the temple, that's Jesus, the chief priests and the elders of the people, this is the religious Jewish leaders, came up to him as he was teaching and they said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? So they were questioning him on things like why he would heal on the Sabbath because it was forbidden by the law to work on the Sabbath. And so he would heal people on the Sabbath. Or his disciples at one time, they had eaten with unwashed hands. There's that ceremonial washing. And they said, why do your disciples eat with unclean hands? He had cleansed the temple. And that was a real sticking point for them. And they wanted to know, who gave you the authority to do what you did, running out the money changers and running out those who were buying and selling? you know, driving them out of the temple. And Jesus said, what well, my father's house, you turn it into a den of robbers, it's supposed to be a house of prayer. Um, what was going on there? Jesus wasn't driving out people who were, um, you know, buying and selling blankets and food. Like in the movies, you see movies about Jesus, you know, and there's people selling all kinds of wares and things. No, they were buying and selling sacrifices, Right? If you were a, a Jewish family, you'd come to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice during Passover, which is when this was happening. You would bring your lamb who was spotless and unblemished, and you would offer that lamb as a sacrifice. But a priest had to examine it first and clear it for sacrifice. If they find a, any kind of imperfection, any spot, any blemish, anything wrong with your lamb, you can't offer as a sacrifice. But I have good news for you. We have some for sale right back over here. Right? And so we'll keep yours. You can trade it in on this newer, cleaner, better, unblemished model for a small nominal fee, and then you can go offer your sacrifice. It's a, it's a racket is what it was. That was the buying and the selling that was going on. The money changers, every male Jew over 18 years old was required by law to bring a, a half a shekel temple tax to, the, to give when they came. Well, um, you remember when we were kids? Some of you guys remember when we were kids? And we'd go to the arcade, right? And you'd give them your dollar, and they would give you what? Tokens, right? They don't do that anymore. They, they give them a debit card. <laughs> you, go in there, you go in there, you put $5,000 on this debit card, and then your kid can play for an hour in there, you know? Um, we'd go in there, we'd give them a dollar, and we'd get four tokens. And each game costs one of those tokens. And then when you're done, they got your dollar and their tokens back, right? <laughs> so that's kind of the half a shekel temple tax is you came, you, you couldn't find a, a, that half shekel. They kept them hoarded there at the temple. And so when you came in, you had to exchange, just like a money exchange for currency, you'd have to give them your denarius, your Roman coin, and then they could give you two shekels, a half, you know, or a shekel, half shekel, and you could give your temple tax. And so it was just another way that this was a very lucrative enterprise, Passover was. That's why Jesus was mad. It wasn't because they were selling lemonade and cookies. and They, they weren't having a bake sale, right? He was mad because they were uh, twisting and distorting and perverting the, the, the temple sacrifice and everything that was about to be 
culminated in his sacrifice when he died on the cross, when he suffered and bled and died. And so, um, well, I got a little sidetracked there. All right, where are we at? Back in verse 24. Uh, Matthew 21, 24. And then so they said, whose authority are you doing this by? And he said, well, I'll ask you a question. And if you tell me the answer, then I will also give you or tell you by what authority I do these things. So here's his question, verse 25. The baptism of John, and you could hear through the Pharisees, scribes, chief priests at that time, you could collectively hear, because they knew they were in for it. He says, John's baptism, where is it from? Heaven or man? We know it's from heaven because of Malachi chapter 4. Right? We know that it is a God-ordained, prophesied ministry and message and baptism that John has. And so Jesus says, where does John's baptism come from? Where does he have the authority to do what he does? Does it come from heaven, from God, or is it from men? And they discussed it among themselves. They had a little holy huddle over here on the side. And they said, uh, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why then did you not believe him? So these leaders did not go out to John for his baptism. And then they said, if we say he is from man, then we should be afraid of the crowd because they believe that John was a prophet. And so they answered him, mm, that's what they said. Right? That was their answer. We don't know. I don't know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you from by what authority I do these things. How does he answer these critics at this point in his ministry towards the very end? points back to John the Baptist and the validity of his message and his baptism and this call to repentance. So that you see validation, so you have a consecration, validation here. Also, just one interesting little part to this, in Matthew 3, 17, here in verse 17 of our passage, it says, um, Behold, a voice came from heaven, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. There's only two other places in your New Testament where God speaks from heaven like this to Jesus or about Jesus. One is in um, the uh, story of the transfiguration. And Peter just kind of, you know, he kind of loses his mind up there after Jesus is transfigured in front of him. He says, oh, it's good for us to be here. How about we build a couple tabernacles, one for you, one for you. And you can just almost picture him just talking really fast. And we, we'll just stay here. It's safer. It's good for us to be up here. And it says in the Bible, while he was still speaking, Imagine getting interrupted by God, right? <laughs> like Peter's talking, and God says, uh, this is my son, whom I am well pleased. He says the exact same thing as his baptism, and then he says, listen to him. So he adds that phrase onto the end. So God speaks at his baptism, at his transfiguration, and then um, right before Jesus is betrayed and crucified, he prays to God and says, God, he says, God, uh, now is the time to glorify the Son, glorify your name. And Jesus, uh, God, again, speaks from heaven and says, I've glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And so this, and this is speaking to the cross and Jesus' sacrifice. Now, in Matthew 3, 17, where it says, this is my beloved Son, with him I'm well pleased, those are two direct quotes from Old Testament passages that every first century Jew understood was a messianic passage. So here, you want to talk about validation? So you have um, the God himself, the voice of God, God himself speaking from heaven, saying, this is my beloved son. Psalm chapter 2, Psalm 2, 7, I will tell of the decree, the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That is a direct quote from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, and everybody, I'm telling you, everybody in Jesus' world, every person who was Jewish in Jesus' world understood that is a messianic psalm. And so when God says that about this guy who's getting baptized, this is my son. Oh, in him I am well pleased. There's no explaining that away. This is who God says he is. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. In Isaiah chapter 42, he says, Behold, my servant. And this is all part of the suffering servant leading up to Psalm 53. Or excuse me, Isaiah 53. He says, Behold, my servant, whom, I'm, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. In him I am well pleased. That's what he's saying. In whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him. Here's the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. 
and he will bring forth justice to the nations. They understood this. This was not a mistake. This was not just some really neat little thing that happened here, part of this story. This is God bringing about his purposes and his plans through John the Baptist and Jesus' submission to him in baptism. You have consecration and validation. The next one you have is proclamation. Proclamation. This is uh, John's announcement to the world, right? That this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's what this baptism was. At first, John hesitated. He tried to prevent Jesus from being baptized by him. But Jesus explained to him, we need to do this in complete and full obedience uh, to righteousness before God. And so Paul, or excuse me, John the Baptist um, relented and he was, oh, oh, John was obedient in this as well, right? This took some courage for him and faith and obedience from John to baptize Jesus. Uh, I was trying to think of the way to say this. You know, how, this is John's official introduction, inauguration of Jesus to the world. I said, I don't know who I said this to. I said, it's like, he goes, dun, dun, dun. Here, you know, this is Jesus, right? And he, he does this in such an amazing fashion. In the water, where everyone can see, in obedience to God, the voice from heaven, the Holy Spirit. You have the Son, this um, very, you know, simple, basic, early picture of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit there. And it is announcing that this is the Savior who was to come. Um, In John chapter 1, this is great, John the Baptist explaining this. He's John expounds upon this baptism. we got three verses here in uh, Matthew. John expounds upon that because he was, he was there, by the way. And uh, says, uh, the next day when he saw Jesus coming, that's John the Baptist. Now, as I read this, I want you to notice there's three things that you're going to see about Jesus here. He's the Son of God. He is the eternal God. And he is the Lamb of God. And here it is. The next day, Jesus, uh, he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Remember what Gabriel tells Joseph when he's thinking about putting away Mary secretly, to divorce her secretly, when he finds out she's with child? Gabriel says, Don't be afraid to take her as your wife, because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and you will name him Jesus. Why? Because he will take, he will save his people from their sins. John says it like this. Here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So here's what you see in this proclamation of John. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He takes away sin. We all have a sin problem in our lives. Every one of us. There's only one remedy for sin. It's the blood of Christ. Right? And so... Uh, It's the forgiveness of sin that we get through Jesus' shed blood on the cross. Well, where does that come from, this idea that Jesus is the Lamb of God? We've got to go back to Exodus. And um, when the Israelites were in Egypt, and God was telling Pharaoh through Moses to let his people go out into the wilderness so that they could worship God. And God was going to, in this plan, this process, God was going to deliver them from the bondage in Egypt and take them back to the promised land. Well, Pharaoh kept relenting, and he would not let them go. So God sends the final plague. You remember what that is? The death angel. And if you don't take the blood of a lamb, everybody in Egypt had to take the blood of a lamb and put it around their doorposts and around their windows. If you didn't do that, your firstborn died. This is the thing that made Pharaoh said, get out, and they fled. They left that night. The Israelites believed God by faith as Moses explained to them what to do. And they took that blood of a lamb and they took some hyssop branches and they painted it around their doors and their windows. And then they roasted this lamb and they had the first Passover meal. So when the death angel came to Egypt that night, if, the, if, if you had the blood around your windows and your door, the death angel would pass over your house. That's why they call it the Passover. It was the blood of this lamb that rescued you. Well, here John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When all these people came to Jerusalem for Passover, when they they came every year to celebrate this, what did they do? They brought their lambs to sacrifice them uh, at the temple. And so here you have Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. That's the first thing that John proclaims. Uh, 
And then he says uh, this. He says, this is he, verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me comes one who ranks before me because he was before me. He's eternal God. He's the son of God. Or he's the lamb of God. He's eternal God. We know, just, just a cursory reading of the New Testament story, that John the Baptist is older than Jesus, right? Mary was pregnant, excuse me, Elizabeth was pregnant before Mary was. John the Baptist is older, a few months older than Jesus. And so um, John says this, uh, he's the one who was coming after me, and he's talking about time there, not like following in his footsteps. He's time. He's coming after me, but he ranks before me. And that's in the idea of importance. Because in, Jewish, in the Jewish mindset, an older man is more important than a younger man, just by, by default. Older is more important. Um, and so here he says, he outranks me. But that what doesn't make sense because we know John was older. He says, uh, because he existed before me or because he was before me. But we know, again, Jesus was a boy lamb. How does that happen? Because Jesus is eternal God. He is the righteous judge. He is the son of God. He is God. He is in the beginning with God. He created all things. All things were created for him, by him, through him, and for his glory, right? We can quote over and over out of the, out of the New Testament how Jesus existed. He's self-existent. He is God. He is eternal. So you have Jesus, the Lamb of God. You have eternal God. And then you have the last one here, the, the Son of God. John says, I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. So John's telling you why his baptism is important there. So all of Israel will see that this is Jesus, the Lamb of God. And uh, John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, meaning Jesus. And I have, this is John's testimony, and I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God, Jesus, our Savior. Now, the last one I have for you is identification. Identification. In baptism, there's a couple of neat things that happen here. One, in, in baptism, Christ identifies with humanity. He identifies with us. That um, high priest who knows what our suffering is like, has suffered like we suffer. It was obedient like we need to be obedient. Who was, you know, followed the, God the Father like we should follow God the Father. Right? I mean, he, Jesus was our perfect example, our perfect model, even in baptism. And when he is, goes through this baptism, submitting to John's baptism, it's not to be saved. It's not to make him righteous. It's uh, fulfilling, you know, an, an act of obedience before God the Father, and it's modeling that obedience for us. And so he identifies with us. You know, I thought of an illustration for this. Um, why does God have to identify with us? Remember back a long time ago, there's a movie called Close Encounters of the Third Kind, right? And these aliens show up, and nobody knows what to make of it. And Richard Dreyfus, you know, he's an actor. I don't know if he's still in I'm sure he is. Richard Dreyfus makes like a, this plateau out of mashed potatoes, and his wife, they start thinking he's crazy, right? Because he's seen in his, in his vision these, this plateau up in Wyoming or something like that. Well, when they finally meet up with these, this alien spaceship, they can't communicate, right? That extraterrestrial life is beyond their comprehension. So you remember the scene in the movie, they're out there? And they go, oh, we got this idea. Let's play some music to them in the space. They're like, bah, 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 bah. right? That's pretty good, actually. <laughs> you might think it sounds crazy, but I'm about right. And then the guy, I don't know what they got. They, they, they got lights, and they're flashing. Bah, 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 bah. And then the spaceship. Bah, 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 bah. And then <laughs> you, I could do this all day. <laughs> but, uh, I got to go to South Dakota here in a little bit. Um, so they're, they're do, why are they doing, why is this happening? This is taking place because they, Richard Dreyfuss, the humans, they can't even get their mind around who these people are. They can't understand them. So they're trying to communicate. So they have to communicate through these sounds and lights flashing, right? The aliens have to communicate to us. They have to reveal themselves to, to humanity because they can't get it. We're too, too obtuse. Can't, we can't get our, our brains around it. That's what God did for us. 
Right? We couldn't invent this story. If you and I, humans, we were going to come up with our own religion and we get to this point right here, the last thing we would do is have our God go get baptized by some crazy dude in the desert right? that's eating locusts and wild honey. That is not how you portray God if you're making God up. But that's exactly what God does. Why? Because he can, so he can identify with us. Why does he need to identify with us? So he can save us. To save us, he had to be like us. But it also allows us to identify with him. And I mentioned this when the girls got baptized earlier. We identify with Christ as a follower of Jesus, right? When we follow in baptism. Baptism is an opportunity for us to identify with Christ as Christ was baptized and we are following in obedience uh, the example that he set before us. And so, if you can remember back to the first thing I said this morning, do you remember your baptism? Do you remember? And maybe throughout everything that we've talked about here, something has maybe pierced your heart, spoken to your heart, and you would say, you know what, I know I, know I got baptized when I was a kid, but to be honest, I have no idea what it meant. I was just doing it because my friends did it. I did it to please my parents. They, you know, my parents kind of pressured me to get baptized. Maybe you would say, you know what? I was truly an infant. And there's a lot of, you know, uh, faiths, you know, denominations, whatever, that practice infant baptism because they believe that you have to be baptized to be saved, that it is sacramental, that it saves you. Uh, maybe, you know, you would just you say, you know what? I got saved, and I was going to get baptized, and then I put it off, and I put it off, and now I'm, wow, it's been so long, I don't even know what I should do. You should follow the Lord in baptism. And I know it's a terrifying thing. I know it's scary. Some kids, you know, children, they just seem to be, I don't know, they're, 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 uh, they're ready to jump in. Man. Like, I'm in. Let's do it, right? And so we kind of have to talk to them and make sure they understand everything. And it's the adults that we got to kind of coax along here. You know, it's going to be okay. Come on up here, right? So maybe that's you. And if it is, I want to encourage you to just let God speak to your heart. I'm going to read one last passage of Scripture to you, and we're going to close. But if you um, want to talk about what it means to be baptized, at the end of the service, I'll be up here. Victor will be here. Maybe Carissa will come over here. We'll be up here, and you can come and talk with us. And, and maybe you're not ready to say, like, well, I'm ready to go up there right now. The water's still warm, right? Okay, we're not going to do that. But I want to do this sometime in the near future. I, need, I want to process it. I want to talk with somebody about it. And I, and I want to do this. I want to follow the Lord in obedience. So if you want to come up here, we'll be up here after the service. We'll kind of have a little invitation time this last song. Um, if you're watching online, you can just go to the you know, Riverview Facebook page, message us there, email the office, let us know. You know. I want someone to talk to me about what it means to be baptized. I want to follow up with this. And we'll get, we will get with you, I promise. If you're uh, here today and you're a guest or a member or anybody, you know, you've been here for a while and you've never been baptized and you want to do that, down here at the bottom it just says question or comments. You can just write, uh, I want to talk to somebody about baptism, right? Or if you just write the word baptism, we'll know, or if you just put a B right there, we'll know what that means, right? Uh, they, they want to talk about baptism. And we'll, we'll get in touch with you. And you can just give us your name and phone number that we can text you on or call you on and say, hey, when do you want to talk about this? And we want to help you with that because it is, like I said, it is so important. It's not required to be saved, but it is required if you're going to be obedient. And it's hard for me to believe that somebody's going to say, you know what, I'm, going to, I'm saved and I'm going to live all my life for Jesus. I'm going to follow him, be obedient to him, but yet I'm going to skip over this first one. I'm just going to avoid that one because of embarrassment or fear or whatever it is. And none of that needs to be, you know, apply because it's a, it's a wonderful, exciting thing as we... Um, you know, sharing our relationship with Christ as we share in baptism, you know, and expressing that. I told you I'd read you one more verse. This is Romans 6, 3, and 4. I, I've quoted this when I was baptized in Brooklyn up there. So uh, it says in verse 3, Do you not know, Paul writing, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, not into water, but baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? So that's that picture of being buried into Christ. You die to yourself that's what baptism is. You're going into that water. It's like you're going into the ground. It's a symbol of you're dying to yourself. You're buried into Christ, into his death. 
uh, and it says, uh, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so when I raised up Brooklyn, I said, raised to walk in newness of life. And that's what this picture of baptism is. And maybe you have never done that. If you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you aren't saved, that's step number one. And that's kind of a problem throughout the history of Baptist churches is we uh, hustle people in to get them baptized before they even realize what being saved means, right? And so step one is being saved, being born again. If you've never done that, if you don't know where you'd spend eternity, if God were to call you home today and you were to stand before him and you don't know if you'd go to heaven or hell, then you need to put your faith in Christ. You need to ask for forgiveness. You need to seek God and humbly just say, Lord, forgive me and save me. Help me to repent and turn from my sin and turn to you, God, and do the deeds worthy of repentance, keeping fruit worthy of repentance. And then the next step is to follow in baptism. And so if you've never done either one of those, please, please, please reach out to one of us today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you, God. Thank you for saving us by your grace. Lord, thank you for modeling baptism for us, God, that um, you never ask us to do something that you haven't done for us already as an example, as a model. And, and this is included, Lord, and thank you for that. God, I pray that you will, um, God, that you will be with folks. And I know there's a lot of people who are confused or worried or stressing over this. God, take that away, please, God. Just show them that you love them. And then now's the time. Now's the time. God, please help them. Father, we thank you. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and we'll sing.